Hi there, and welcome to this Cooperative Extension uh, Twitter chat on year-end financial planning strategies. Uh, you're watching the YouTube live uh, portion of uh, today's event. You can also engage uh, on this conversation on Twitter using the hashtag EXChat, that's E-X-C-H-A-T. Uh, welcome, I'm Bob Birch. I'm a web technology specialist at North Dakota State university and i'll be moderating our panel discussion today as we uh, welcome our panelists uh, dr bryce jorgensen from new mexico state university welcome bryce thank you appreciate it uh, dr hi <laughs> dr laura hendrix of the university of arkansas hi and uh, dr lauren jones from ohio state university hello and as usual, if you've uh, joined us for one of these uh, conversations before, uh, Eric Anderson from the University of Idaho is here uh, to be our uh, Twitter facilitator. He'll be filling us in on what's going on in the Twitter chat. So if you're just listening uh, or viewing on YouTube Live and you're not engaging in the Twitter chat, uh, Eric will keep us connected with what's going on over there. Hey, Eric. Hi, Bob. Glad to be here today. So we're going to talk about year end financial planning strategies, obviously something that uh, is on everybody's mind, especially uh, this time of year. And we'll start with uh, a question for Lauren. Lauren, what are some of the best kept financial secrets for winding down this year and planning ahead uh, for 2017? Well, the end of the year can be a great time um, for people to start thinking about uh, potentially starting a savings account or increasing their savings rate. Um, you know, often people are receiving holiday bonuses. And if we're thinking ahead to the new year, we can, uh, many of us expect tax refunds to come. So when we expect sort of lump sum increases in our income, this can be a really excellent opportunity to start saving. Of course, it's always easier to save if you don't have to reduce your spending to do so, if you're getting sort of a new chunk of money to do it. So a time to potentially open up a savings account um, and uh, have that money sort of directly transfer into a savings account. Um, you know, keep yourself uh, away from the money so it becomes easier to save and um, sort of work with either your tax preparer or your employer to have money uh, transferred either directly into a retirement savings account or a um, potentially uh, new savings account for um, emergencies. Uh, Laura, you know, Lauren uh, mentioned getting ready to save. That's kind of, This is kind of a hard time of year to do it with, uh, for some of us celebrating Christmas with gift buying and that kind of thing uh, coming up. Are there things that we can do in terms of controlling our spending when we're, we're thinking about that, that gift buying season? Uh, absolutely. And that's one of the things that we think about in December. We think about um, holiday spending and uh, tax time right around the corner and the New Year's resolution. So holiday spending. I think one of one of my favorite holiday spending mm -hmm. tax tips and so many people are already heavily into having started that already. But I really like to focus on things other than gifts. So if you think back through your childhood and try to remember what you got for Christmas every year, most of us, that's the gifts aren't really what stands out to us. It's usually those other holiday family traditions. So I that's my starting point is to put the emphasis on that instead of on those material goods. But that being said, we are spending for the holidays. And I think the things that typically apply to good consumer decisions apply for the holidays as well. So um, looking at looking at your budget and setting a good spending limit, making a, a good list of who you want to buy for and what you want to spend money on, and maybe even designating a certain amount of for each purchase and then shopping around, comparison shopping, using uh, coupons, combining discounts so that you get the best deal on those things that you do intend to purchase. Bryce, anything to add to that about, you know, I don't know if we want to call them secrets. I guess in the question we call them secrets in quotes, but but maybe they're just uh, tips that not all of us think of for the, for the end of the year. One of the things I like to do is I know that um, at my employment, I can't roll over my uh, FSA. And so if anybody has a flexible spending account that they need to use, they should be looking into, uh, especially if it's a medical uh, savings account, to use that before 
the end of the year because if they don't use that, that's money lost. And so uh, I know that some of my friends and I uh, look at the end of November, beginning of December, and if there's things that uh, we need to do or our children need to have happen, we take care of that. So we use 100% of our uh, FSA account. So that's one thing I'd suggest people do. Uh, Bryce, are flexible spending accounts, do that, does that end of spending vary? Is it by state or is it by your your service provider? Um, you know, that's a good question. I think it can vary by a service provider, but for all the ones that I know, they end uh, on the year. So December 31st, they expire. There may be some, been some differences that I'm not aware of, um, but most people, my guess, if they have an S FSA account, it will be expiring December 31st. So they should look at ways that they can use that in some way that's beneficial for them without having to lose that money. Great, thanks. Uh, Eric, I know that the Twitter conversation is probably just getting going. And by the way, if, if you want to join that conversation and uh, maybe do double duty, don't don't leave us here on YouTube live, but uh, check out Twitter at the same time. You can follow the hashtag EXChat. Uh, Eric, what are folks saying on Twitter about best kept financial secrets? Well, you're correct. It's uh, They're just getting started in the conversation, but we have a few good responses uh, that I can share. Uh, we have a a uh, tweet from America Saves, and uh, they mentioned that at the end of the year, your budget for the current year is is coming to an end, and so now it's time to get ready with a new budget plan for the coming year. Um, there was some comments from the panel about some of the tax implications at the end of the year, and um, our own um, Dr. Barbara O'Neill mentions that if you have investment, an investment portfolio, you might want to look at um, possibly selling some items um, and looking at the capital gains or perhaps a, even a loss that you could use um, for your taxes for this year as well. And we've got several more coming in that I haven't even read yet. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Eric. And Eric will keep us up to date on what's going on on Twitter. Well, uh, Eric mentioned taxes and we were kind of getting around to that uh, that subject. So uh, let's talk about year end tax tips, you know, helping people uh, save on taxes and prepare for the upcoming uh, tax filing season. Uh, Bryce, uh, one of the things that might fit the the answer for for both of these questions is taking a look at your at your w-4 and i i can tell you it's something that i did when i was hired and i have not thought about it since is that something people should do regularly yeah a lot of times uh when i meet with people that i find that they have too much money coming out uh, and they don't claim enough on their w-4 and so for some people that's good because they like to have the refund. It's kind of an automatic savings for them, even though they're not getting any interest, they like to have that refund. But for those people like me that want money throughout the year and would rather not lend money to the IRS for free, interest-free, I claim more deductions. I look at my W-4 and say, you know, if I'm getting this much in a tax refund, I need to claim, you know, instead of eight, maybe nine or 10 or 11, so that I can have more money in my paycheck. So it's always a good idea to look over the year, uh, especially when tax time comes up to see how much of a refund or if you have to pay and adjust your W-4 at that time. Uh, do you have any other tax tips for people as they're getting ready for uh, the end of the year? Yeah, one thing that I like to do and I encourage other people to do is kind of, um, especially if they itemize uh, their taxes and they give a significant amount to charitable contributions um, is to bunch those. And so, for example, you could pay um, a bunch of money January 1st for say 2016, and then pay at the end of the year uh, in December and kind of have two years of giving, but you do that in one year. And so you do that every other year. And so if you're giving, let's say $5,000 a year, one year in 2016, you give 10,000. And then in 2011 or 2017, you don't give any. And then in 2018, you give 10,000. And it's kind of at the beginning and end of the year. So it, it spreads it out. And that way you have more money in order to um, deduct if you're itemizing. Maybe you itemize one year and then you take the standard deduction the next year. That's uh, one suggestion that people could do. Great. Uh, Laura, any other tax tips that come to mind for you? 
Um, yes, yeah, so a little bit more about charitable contributions. So if it's a larger amount of contribution, $250 or more, you're going to want some kind of receipt for that. And again, just to, to underscore what we've already said is you have until December 31st to make those charitable contributions. So in addition to that warm, fuzzy holiday giving feeling, you also get that nice little tax break for those of us who are uh, itemizing. But if you um, use any of the, the easy forms, if you don't itemize your taxes, this is not something that would apply to you. So um, definitely something to consider for itemizing. One other tax tip, um, you know, ideally we would all keep perfect records and be so organized with our taxes all year long, but sometimes that doesn't happen. So um, during the holiday break, if you have a little extra time on your hands, it's a great time to start organizing records for tax season. Yeah, that's a that's a great tip. As uh, I think you know, as some people have some time off or taking some time off for the holidays to set aside some time to do that, and not uh, not do that in the you know on April fourteen. Um, do as I say, not as I do. By the way, and uh, <laughs> Lauren, do you have anything else to add to the to the tips for uh, getting ready for the upcoming uh, tax season? Yeah, I think um, now is a really great time to sort of start thinking ahead about if you are expecting a tax refund, what you're going to plan to do with it. Um, so, you know, one option that the IRS provides is to have your refund move directly into a um, savings account or a uh, IRA. And so potentially thinking about, you know, what your plan is going to be for that money now, uh, getting yourself ready savings account if that's what you need to do, um, doing a little research into what interest rates you can achieve if you're looking at uh, sort of other uh, financial instruments to um, save in, and, and sort of laying out the groundwork so that when you go to file your return uh, in January or February, you are sort of all set up to have um, that return go into a, a safe and beneficial savings instrument. Yeah, great tip. Thanks. Eric, uh, what are they saying on Twitter? So comments on Twitter uh, are mirroring some of the suggestions for making time to plan and organize your, um, your uh, documents uh, before, as you mentioned, before the uh, tax preparation, tax return preparation season happens. Um, there were some comments also about the um, charitable contributions that Bryce covered earlier as well. Uh, there was one additional suggestion from Lorna Woundedhead, and she suggested that uh, it'd be good to review your contributions to qualified retirement accounts. And if you have opportunities before the end of the year to meet your maximum, that would be another tax advantage that you could take care of this year. Could I jump on that one as well? Sure, jump in, Bryce. So, um, yeah, if we haven't maximized the IRA uh, accounts or um, 401ks, then we should definitely do that. One thing that's expiring this year is the geothermal credit. And then there's the solar credit if people are looking to do that as well. I know that I just built a home and put geothermal in, and there's a 30% tax deduction that expires uh, if, if, as long as you start in December. Um, and so I, I also moved my some money I had in an IRA to a Roth IRA, and that's going to offset what deduction I get, tax credit for um, the geothermal. And it's actually a tax credit rather than a tax deduction. Though. So up to 30% of the cost of putting in a geothermal or a solar, which actually I think expires in 2019, so you have more time to do that, can offset some of these choices you can make in possibly like me, switching from an IRA to a Roth IRA. Great. Thanks, Bryce. I, I want to mention, too, that uh, in addition to our panel here on YouTube Live, we've got experts out there on Twitter to answer your questions. And you've heard uh, Eric mention some of them, Dr. Barb O'Neill from Rutgers University, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Kiss is out there from Kansas State University, and uh, Dr. Lorna Sabo, Wounded Head from South Dakota State University, all on Twitter, uh, responding to your questions and comments as well as we uh, continue with this Twitter chat and YouTube Live event. Uh, if you want to participate on Twitter, the hashtag is EX chat e x c h a t let's continue with our questions here on youtube live and uh laura uh, this 
I mean, talk about stating the obvious. The holidays can be very expensive, um, if anybody hadn't noticed. Um, well, what suggestions do you have for saving money during this season? Well, we, we talked a little bit about some of those earlier about uh, using all of those good consumer strategies that, that typically apply, setting limits, making lists, and sticking to it. I think one of the challenges for consumers during the holiday season is uh, that um, the impulse buying, because we, you know, holiday music, bombarded by advertisements, Christmas decorations in the store, and that feeling of wanting to make the holidays perfect for our families, for our friends and loved ones, there can be a lot of pressure. So that comfort shopping and impulse buying can, can really, we can really be hard hit by those. So that's one thing to be aware of. And then just stick to a spending limit. And again, focus on holiday traditions rather than the more material aspect of the holidays. And I, another thing that I like to do that kind of manages that spending and the holiday stress is to plan some kind of um, something for after the holidays, something for after Christmas and family outing or a family get together, something that kind of takes the focus off of that that one day and the and the gift giving. Bryce, uh, how do you deal with it in in your family budget with the sort of just? I mean, it, we talked about we talked about gifts and things, but there's you know for some of us there's holiday travel. There's just a lot of things that that tend to add up this time of year. Yeah, and my wife and I actually were talking about that last night. We're talking about the gifts for our kids. And as I just mentioned, we just moved into our home right before Thanksgiving and with a new home and, and other things that's expensive. And so we had to look at our budget and just say, you know, how much do we have to spend and what can we do that will bring memories? You know, really focus on, on memories. And so if that's traveling, we are traveling to visit family uh, in Arizona and in California. And so some of that money might be spent there. And so instead of focusing on things, right, that uh, Lauren was saying, maybe we talk about experiences and the money that we have and being um, you know, purposeful in how we spend that money. One of the ways that my kids like to give uh, my wife and I our gifts are through service. And I love those. They give us little coupon books and it says, you know, uh, 10 minutes of massaging dad's feet, something like that. So I, I prefer that than having some trinket that they that they picked up. So thinking of creative ways to spend time together, to create meaning, to have experiences, and those don't always take or need money. And I think those those can be the most powerful and most remembered experiences. Uh, Lauren, do you have uh, additional suggestions for saving uh, money during this holiday season? I think um, the rest of the panel has given such great suggestions. Uh, the only thing I can think to add is um, sort of trying to find fun ways to limit the number of people that you have to buy for. So implementing some kind of secret Santa thing. Um, you know, my family, uh, I go home to visit my parents at the holidays, um, but we're all sort of older now, all the, you know, kids and cousins and su such are older. Uh, so rather than sort of everyone getting everyone a present, we'll draw and uh, everyone's only responsible for getting one person a present. Um, and that really keeps spending under control. Oh, one thing we haven't talked about is just, you know, um, taking the time to to compare prices and, and things like that. Um, it's hard. It's hard for me anyway, this time of year and, and the rush is on, you know, as we are, uh, uh, 12 days away from from Christmas I guess partridge in a pear tree today right if it's if we're 12 <laughs> days away um, but it, it takes time but it is it, it's definitely worth it to to comparison shop and those kinds of things is that do you think so Laura or? I think especially on bigger ticket items and um, one thing about comparison shopping is that shopping online makes it really easy to do that so you may even end up buying it in the store but shopping online kind of kind of makes it easy to comparison shop for big ticket items. And then looking for so many places have sales and discounts. And if there are places where you know you're you kind of have in mind you're going to shop there or it's a place you regularly shop, oftentimes different businesses have apps you can use that will help you find good deals or automatically download coupons or so and it, comparing sell flyers and using other discounts are great ways to make sure that you get the the best deal on on those items. 
Great, thanks, Laura. Hey, hey Eric, uh, what's how's the Twitter chat going? What any suggestions for saving money during the holiday season? I'm really impressed at how in sync the uh, Twitter conversation is with the, the comments by the panelists, and and so several of the great ideas that have been suggested have been echoed. Uh, we have more conversation going on, which is great to see on the Twitter chat. Um, Wisebread mentioned about. Uh, shopping, looking for deals, um, finding where the lowest prices are, taking advantage of promotions, using coupons. Uh, there were several comments about uh, focusing on giving experiences uh, rather than things. Um, and we have Connecticut fa Families and Finances who suggested planning a, a fun group outing with your family or friends. Um, and you could do that locally. And there's lots of events going on this, this time of year in particular. So lots of great, very similar ideas. Great, thanks, Eric. Uh, you know, Lauren, here we're talking about the holidays and and Christmas, and you know, right on the heels, it's it the first of the year is going to come. And uh, uh, as many people, I like to think anyway that I I uh, have company in this. I will probably make some kind of uh, New Year's resolution about saving or spending or doing a budget or those kinds of things. Uh, do you have suggestions for how we can we can kind of keep those uh, resolutions and not let them fall by the wayside as as many of our resolutions do? Yeah, I think um, you know the most important your resolution is that it's uh, achievable and realistic. Um, I think you know so many people, not just in the financial area, but sort of many realms of life make resolutions that are, are sort of very ambitious and exciting, but potentially, um, you know, not realistically achievable for, uh, for an individual. So, um, you know, and I think doing that can really sort of be discouraging in the, in the long run when you've made a resolution and set yourself up to fail uh, to, be going with, to begin with. So I think sort of having resolutions that are small and manageable um, and ones that you can sort of easily achieve uh, and then scale up later once you've uh, begin began to develop good habits, I think that's a really good approach. Um, I also like to use uh, some sort of interesting apps uh, and technology to help me keep my resolutions. One that an app that I've been sort of interested in lately is one called Coach Me, which is a free app. Uh, it's a habit building app and it allows you to sort of um, track your progress in achieving a goal uh, and help you develop a good habit. So this would be a great thing to, for people to, who are kind of techie and into data um, and interested in sort of tracking their progress. Uh, is a great way to sort of make the um, your progress towards your resolution more observable and uh, you know make it make yourself sort of feel more engaged with achieving the goal and developing a good habit. That's a great suggestion. I love the idea of, of using the app and I'm I'm writing down coach me right now. I hope everybody else is yeah, I can, really yeah I'd like to download that. I have plenty of plenty of personal things to work on uh, in my life. I could use use some behavior change help. Uh, Bryce, what do you think? Uh, are there other ways that we can kind of go about keeping those promises to ourselves? I think so. Definitely needs to be written down. You know, they say if it's not written down, then a goal is just a wish. Um, also, besides just doing the same thing and looking at your finding your last year's resolutions and writing the same things down that you stopped maybe a month later. Um, making a couple of choices that really excite you, that you really want to do something and kind of answer the question, what's in it for me? Why do I really want to do this? And then after that, if it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, engaging and, and exciting to you, say, what are some obstacles? So I know working out is always one for me. And so what are obstacles for me not going to work out? And then what are ways that I can overcome those obstacles? So going with somebody to the gym or making myself accountable to somebody. So if I write down not a lot of them, not just what I did last year, but a couple things that I really am excited about, even if it's a short term, it doesn't have to be New Year's resolutions for the whole year. Maybe it's just a New Year's resolution for the first two or three months. Write those couple things down. What are the obstacles? Uh, what's in it for me? How can I overcome those obstacles? 
and then really focus on trying to accomplish those because of what's in it for, for you. And, and if it's, again, something that's exciting to you, hopefully that'll motivate you uh, to continue with those. Hey, Laura, I love what Bryce just said about obstacles. Are there uh, common obstacles that people run up against when they're uh, setting financial goals, like saving more money? Um, I, I think that there are. I think there are um, kind of two categories of challenges. One, one is just finances. Maybe, maybe you're not really set up to achieve the goal that you had in mind. And I think that the other are those things that fall into that category of um, behavior change issues. So I would say on the, the money strategy, and this is a great year, it is a great time to kind of take a little snapshot of where you are financially. There are several ways to do that. One is to look at net worth. So that's uh, total assets minus total liabilities, and we want that to be positive, and we want to see that increasing from year to year. So that's a great way to look at setting a goal. Uh, another is to check a debt-to-income ratio to make sure you're within what the recommended limits of debt-to-income are. Um, uh, looking at emergency savings, making sure that that's the amount two to six months of enough to cover expenses for two to six months, and then making sure you're on track with retirement savings. So if any of those, if you're not living within an, your income or your budget to begin with, that's going to throw you off track. And then for the behavior change side of that, there's a great resource and Barb O'Neill, who is on the Twitter chat end of this, um, this resource is from her. It's called Small Steps to Health and Wealth, and it covers 25 behavior change strategies that are based on theories from psychology and it's a great tool to look through and pick out things that might be obstacles for you and look at proven ways that we can deal with those behavior change strategies so small steps to health and wealth great resource for dealing with those obstacles yeah that is fantastic work that barb and her colleagues uh, did on that on that program so go ahead and google that i think i think there's some great advice whether it's a financial goal or some other goal, uh, just for behavior change, as you said, Laura. Hey, Eric, what's uh, what's Twitter saying about these strategies for keeping our resolutions? There were several um, posts that mention uh, SMART goals, and the word SMART there is an acronym, and uh, which stands for, um, in fact, Navicore Solutions spelled it out for me. Uh, the SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable realistic and timed. And there were also um, several comments related to the how to keep the goals achievable and um, Kathy Sweedler uh, just said keep it simple and uh, that's uh, probably uh, excellent advice in terms of breaking those goals into achievable parts. Uh, widespread also suggested um, another approach having many goals and again breaking a larger goal down into uh, pieces and use those mini goals as benchmarks to uh, know your progress and keep yourself motivated towards your larger goals great thanks eric hey if you're just joining us uh, this is a youtube live broadcast uh, in coordination with a twitter chat on year-end financial planning strategies brought to you by uh, cooperative extensions uh, extension personal finance uh, community of practice so we're glad to have you along uh, today and we have a panel of experts to uh, answer uh, some some pressing questions about uh, the end of the year and holiday spending and and uh, much more uh, if you want to participate on the the twitter chat uh, just use the hashtag ex chat. So Bryce, um, we've talked about all the stuff that the holidays brings and all that stuff means some stress for us as well. Um, you know, we probably can't do anything about worrying about if the family's going to fight, you know, at the Christmas dinner table or anything like that. But maybe we can do something about reducing some of the financial stress. Do you have uh, some tips for uh, making the, the holidays less stressful, at least financially? Sure. I, I believe we, we've already talked about kind of alternative gift giving strategies and kind of making it, keeping it simple. Uh, one thing I'd like to just highlight is really making a list of who we really need to give gifts to. Sometimes we think we have to give them to everyone. Again, so I have five children and uh, my siblings have children. And so we're not going to give gifts to every nephew and niece, uh, even every sibling. Right. And so uh, how are we going to keep those expectations um, realistic? And then 
determine the total amount that you have to spend. And that could be traveling, that could be uh, for gifts, and then look at who you want to give, where you're traveling, and divide those out and then make adjustments as needed. One thing that causes stress though is debt. And so what we don't want to have happen is just us putting all of these things on our credit card saying, well, I can pay that off later. What we should have been doing and can start as a New Year's resolution since we just talked about that, is to pay ourselves a little bit every month towards that Christmas fund so we have that in cash to pay. We don't want to be paying for Christmas into May and June. And then the last thing I'll say is maybe have a gratitude journal or talk about with your family and friends and others about things you're grateful for. I think as we are grateful and go out and maybe serve as a, as a family or as an individual, others who are less fortunate, uh, that stress goes away, the importance of um, buying things goes down and we can make more manageable purchases and uh, be grateful for those things that we already have. Thanks, Bryce. Great advice. Uh, Lauren, do you have other tips for reducing holiday uh, season financial stress? Um, I think uh, a good tip that I certainly use is to um, make sure that I don't forget about taking care of myself through all of this. Um, so, you know, of course, we all want to um, get you know, really great gifts for people we love. We want to express to them how we feel about them. But if in the process of doing that, you know, you're putting yourself in a financial position where you're going, you're making yourself miserable and unhappy, uh, I could guarantee you that your loved ones do not want you doing that. So, you know, don't forget that in all this, you know, if you find yourself reaching a point where you are are getting really stressed out and you're sort of finding yourself miserable um, in this great time of year, which I think opens, you know, need to just take a step back and sort of revise um, expectations and revise your own plans and your own expectations for yourself in the season. Hey, Laurie, you know, we've we've done, you've been on a couple of these panels over the years and something that, that comes up a lot is uh, related to financial stress is just the idea of being able to talk about money. You know, Bryce mentioned earlier, sitting down with his wife and talking about the budget. Uh, is it, uh, That seems like something that we've talked about before in terms of a way to reduce stress is just to be open about, you know, what the plan is and what you're spending. Um, that That's a good point. And I agree it is uh, important Maybe during the height of this hectic holiday season, it's not the best time to decide for the first time you're going to sit down with your spouse and talk about all your money issues. But um, probably end of, end of the year, planning finances for next year is a good time to maybe start to move toward that conversation. And just always to remember to approach that with uh, kindness and respect and compassion and uh, remember to use good communication skills, but just to, to weigh in a bit on that holiday stress, one thing I wanted to add is um, if for anyone who's using a credit card, have, try to have a plan in advance on how you'll pay that off. So that helps to deal with a little that, of that pressure of knowing that you, that you have some outstanding balance on your credit card. And then just the things we always need to do to manage stress. So it's a hectic time of year with or without the financial burden, so the things we always need to do for ourselves to manage stress, which are um, eat, eat right, exercise on a regular basis, make sure we're getting enough sleep, and breathe. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, fair enough. I won't. Uh, I won't jump into uh, uncharted waters and you know uh, upset the apple cart too much during the the financial season. And start uh, uh, berating my significant other about. Uh, about budget and all this stuff. That's a good. That's a good point. Um, on the end of, on that. Yeah, go ahead, Bryce. So, talking about communication, one thing that uh, I had to do when I was first married is my wife's family always got gifts for everybody. And as the family's grown, and you know, that's when we were in graduate school, we had to have that conversation that says, you know, we just don't financially. We we can't financially do that. And so starting new traditions is okay as families change and adapt and as you have more children and your uh, siblings have more children to say, what are different ways we can celebrate Christmas and holidays and you know, time other than what we've done in the past that makes sense for everybody. And so we now have new different traditions that we can do. It's within our budget, 
that everybody's happy with. So don't don't worry about or don't shy away from having some of those conversations with in-laws or siblings or cousins or others instead of locking that in and just buying it on your credit card and being stressed out because that's what people expect of you communicating uh, is definitely a better way to do yeah great advice hey uh, Eric uh, what are folks saying on Twitter about this uh, ways to reduce financial stress there's very similar um, suggestions. Um, I have one uh, from Connecticut Families and Finances, uh, reinforces what Bryce was just saying, that uh, it's an opportunity to, re to revisit holiday traditions and see that they still make sense. Um, Anthony Copeman suggested that um, not everyone, and this relates to an earlier comment, not everyone may want a gift from you. They may just simply want to spend time with you. And then on the non-financial um, elements that also tend to lead to stress at this time of year, um, Lorna Wounded Head suggests that you focus on balancing your time um, and then realize you don't have to attend or participate in every holiday gathering and there tend to be a lot of them uh, during this season. Great, thanks Eric. Well, we've got a couple of, of tax questions here, um, so I'm just going to throw them out there and, and uh, panel jump in on this. Um, this is one I need help with. What is the required minimum distribution and what kind of tax planning is needed by year end? I, that sounds familiar, required minimum distribution, but I, I couldn't answer it. Who can jump in panel and help us with that term? Well, we uh, usually think of um, the required, the R&D, the required minimum distribution in relationship to uh, a payout that you have to take from your retirement account. So that might be your IRA or uh, could be something that had been an employer-provided account. Something that you have at a certain amount, you've reached that age where you have to start taking money out and there may be a required amount that you have to take out during the year. Now, some people may uh, still have other other kinds of income throughout the year. It could be employment income or it could be uh, investment income. And then adding this to it is definitely, you know, something that some people might need to look at how that would impact what tax bracket they're going to be in. Typically, we can consider that by the time we get to the point that we're having to take those required um, withdrawals from accounts that will be in a lower tax bracket and so it won't bump our income up or we'll have to pay more taxes but that's something to definitely something to look at and maybe one of the other panelists has more to add to it. I'll add something so you know it's those who are 70 and a half need to start taking this minimum distribution and they need to do it uh, in the correct way because if they they don't um, take that distribution correctly, the tax penalty could be up to 50% uh, on what they should have withdrawn but then didn't withdraw. And so you definitely need to talk with a tax um, specialist and find out where you fit, how it might affect, uh, like Laura said, your taxable income. But if you're 70 and a half, you need to start taking at least that minimum distribution or otherwise there's larger penalties than than if you would have taken it anyway. So definitely talk with the tax accountant about your situation. And what about earned income tax credit? That was our other tax uh, uh, question. Who can take it? How does it lower your taxes? That's one I guess that I think maybe a few more of us are familiar with because it affects maybe a bigger group of people. Uh, Lauren, do you have, can you explain earned income tax credit a little bit for us? Sure. Um, the Earned Income Tax Credit is a refundable tax credit uh, that's available for low to moderate income families. Um, most it's sort of targeted at families with children. Um, so if you are a family with sort of three plus children, um, you're going to be eligible to claim this on your taxes if you make anywhere less than about fifty-five or sixty thousand dollars a year. So we're really you know, moving up the income distribution um, eligible for the credit. Uh, it's a large credit, so the maximum credit for um, families with three 
children or more is over $6,000. Um, if you have one child, um, it's the federal credit is going to be over $3,000. So these are you know large amounts of money. And the thing to remember about these is that they're refundable. So what that means is that even if you don't have a tax liability, even if you um, don't earn enough money in the year to uh, have to pay federal income taxes, you're still going to get this tax credit when you file your taxes. Uh, so you're still going to get a check in the mail from the IRS um, that supplements your income. One in five eligible families uh, you know, families who are eligible for the earned in income tax credit don't claim it. And so many of those families are going to be uh, sort of families who don't necessarily owe income taxes and for that reason uh, are not filing their taxes. Uh, but it's important for those families to know that, you know, even if you don't owe taxes, you know, you should file because you could be eligible to get this money um, from the IRS. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention uh, for this year, a new law has been passed which um, says that if you are a family that receives the earned income tax credit uh, as a way of sort of cutting down on fraud and those kinds of issues, the IRS has decided that they're not going to be paying refunds until February 15th or after. So if you're a family who gets the earned income tax credit, you know, often, um, you know, many people who are eligible for this money tend to tr expect to be able to file their taxes and get their refund in sort of late January, early February. This year, you will not be able to get your, your refund until February 15th. So that's something for families to keep in mind uh, for this tax year as well. Uh, Bryce or Laura, anything to add to our, our kind of big tax questions there about earned income tax credit or required minimum distribution? I would comment that families who are eligible for the earned income tax credit, families with children, should also uh, look into the child care tax credit and the child tax credit. So those are those are two others that people low to moderate income households with children would also probably qualify for, and then also probably would qualify for some kind of free filing assistance, either a free file or um, filing for free electronically with IRS.gov or VITA. And then one more caution to to people is, um, you know, we talk about those advanced refund loans that come usually with a pretty hefty charge. And if you file electronically and have your return direct deposited, that comes in really pretty quickly. And so there's no reason to go ahead and do the advanced refund loan. So that's another caution I would give for consumers at, at tax time. Great. Thanks. Hey, Eric, any, uh, anything about the required minimum distribution or earned income tax credit on Twitter that, uh, that our panelists haven't, haven't covered? The, um, there was one statement or comment about the required min minimum distributions from Lorna Wounded Head, who mentioned that they are becoming a bigger deal these days because of the aging baby boomers and the oldest of the baby boomers are turning 70. Uh, this year, so those implications are starting to uh, to affect that demographic. And then I think the panel has covered most of the other comments related to the earned income tax credit. Perfect. Thanks, Eric. Uh, hey, we're talking about uh, income refunds, Laura, and or income tax refunds, I should say, and uh, holiday bonuses. And so we've been talking a lot about spending, but this also might be a time of year in the next uh, several months where you might have a chunk of money. Uh, what's What are some good uses for that where you have that sort of uh, windfall, so to speak? Um, I, I think there, there are a couple of things. I think it depends on, a, on the particular consumer's situation. So I mentioned a little earlier about looking at net worth, debt to income ratio, emergency savings funds amount, retirement plans. So certainly if any of there was a shortfall in any of those areas, that would be a good use of that. An important tip I think for consumers is to, um, I like the idea we say it a lot at tax time, spend some, save some. So that can apply to a bonus too. So usually when we have those windfalls, it's really tempting to spend some, but just make sure that, that you have a plan to save some of that. And direct deposit 
is a great way to do that because it's easier to save it if you never see it or get your hands on it. And for tax time, that's form 8888 is the direct deposit form. And you can use that to deposit in up to three different accounts. Great. Thanks, Laura. Hey, Bryce, uh, what about sort of using some of that to reduce debt? Is that uh, a potential use of, of these holiday bonuses or income tax refund? Definitely. Going back to the SMART goals, if we have some <clears throat> financial SMART goals, then we know already kind of where we would want that money to go. If we have some uh, goals to pay off debt, to have a small emergency fund. And so definitely these high cost credit cards that are uh, 12, 14, 18, 24 percent. Um, what I would do is I'd make sure that I'd have a little bit in an emergency fund, 500, 1,000 dollars maybe and then look at any consumer debt I have, starting with the credit cards and then going towards even auto loans and others to be able to pay those off so that more of our money is coming into our pocket and less is going to interest to the bank's pocket. So definitely having an emergency fund and paying off uh, some of those cards would be beneficial. And then keeping a little to spend and, and, and have some fun with, I think is, is always good, but trying to put most of that towards accomplishing our financial goals. Uh, Lauren, anything to add to that about uses for these holiday bonuses or, or tax refunds? I think uh, the other panelists have covered uh, most of what I would suggest. Um, one other thing I just wanted to make sure everyone knows about is uh, a fun way to sort of, you know, make saving around tax time fun is to um, join the America Saves campaign. and. Uh, sort of pledge to save towards something if you find it um, sort of exciting or um, motivating to work with other people you can sort of make a savings uh, pledge campaign in your neighborhood or with friends um, where you can sort of all you know pledge together to save towards some goal um, so if you're interested in kind of doing that there are some great suggestions on the um, America Saves website and I should mention American Saves Week is February 27th through March 4th. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, Eric, um, how are folks reacting to this question on Twitter about uh, what to do with those lump sums? They are uh, very much in agreement with the sentiments that have been expressed by the panelists of uh, uh, paying down debt and or adding to savings. Um, and that was stated pretty directly by widespread as well. Um, uh, our own Dr. Barbara O'Neill mentioned uh, the emergency uh, savings funds, which were, were also mentioned by our panel, um, to focus on making sure that that, that is, is there before addressing some other issues. Anthony Copeman um, talked about the paying down debt and said focus on the high interest debt first, like credit cards. Um, and then a really good uh, piece of advice from Lorna Wounded Head and particularly related to tax refunds that may be coming later is don't spend the funds before you receive them. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> um, it, Bryce, where, where do you suggest people go for help with, with some of these decisions? I mean, uh, I hope that uh, people have gotten a lot of information from this broadcast and from the, the Twitter chat, but uh, it, are there other places people can go to get some help with these decisions and actions? Uh, just to their next door neighbor. No, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook. Um, <laughs> they can, you know, the, the local uh, cooperative extension office has a lot of resources that they can go to uh, and talk, talk to people. Um, there's different um, financial planners that they may recommend that are focused on uh, accomplishing goals rather than just transactions and, and paying per transaction which actually can then cost more than just kind of by the hour or, or uh, the fee only so i'd recommend one place to go to your local cooperative extension and ask what resources that uh, they have in the, that local area uh, Lauren, are there particular resources that, that you're a fan of uh, that you think would be helpful for people this, this time of year? Yeah, I think um, there are some great uh, online resources, and Laura mentioned 
tax prep opportunities available. Um, so the federal government runs the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, the VITA program, um, and that's a free tax prep program that's available in most communities for uh, sort of lower to mid income Americans and then also um, older Americans and veterans. So if you fall into any of those groups, you have a, a tax preparer that you can work with face to face to help you prepare your taxes. Um, and that can be a great resource for what can often be a sort of complicated and daunting um, financial task. Uh, Laura, anything to add to that about uh resources for people during this time of year? Uh, I, I would mention a couple of my favorites. We talked about cooperative extension service resources, which are great research-based, trustworthy sources. A couple of my favorite are um, PowerPay.org, which is a really great way to look. So many consumers struggle with paying off credit card debt, and it's kind of a, a sign-in with a username and password, so it's a secure account. And you can look at different ways to, to pay off credit cards. So highest interest first or pay off the lowest balance first. So it's really kind of a fun tool to play around with. And it has great educational information for money management as well. And then the other thing is something that I mentioned earlier, small steps to health and wealth. And really for anyone who's looking at, at having success with New Year's resolutions that are money related, it's a great way to put some really concrete strategies in place that are proven things to help us achieve success with behavior change. Well, let's let's wrap things up here with some final financial planning tips. Um, uh, so I'll ask each, each of our panelists to, you know, let's have some end of the year wisdom. No pressure. Um, on the wisdom point, but Laura, Lauren, uh, what what final tips do you have for people as they enter this uh, this year end uh, financial planning season? Um, well, I think that you know my final tip is remember that um, you know financial well being is produced through you know kind of consistent and um, manageable individual decisions. So making good decisions over and over again every day. Um, so, you know, having a budget, sticking to that budget, uh, in some ways there's there's sort of no magic to it, right? There's um, just picking up a, a course of action and, and sticking to it. Um, so I think the tip I'd give is to sort of make those decisions as easy as you possibly can for yourself. So don't sort of expose yourself to things that are tempting for you. Um, keep the goals that you have manageable and small and just sort of treat it as a day-to-day -day, uh, behavior change that you need to work towards. Thanks, Lauren. Bryce, wh what do you have to leave folks with? Well, I, I liked what she said about um, making it easy on yourself because when it's easy, then we will do that change. I think it's all about behavior change. And even though we know we should work out or we know we should save or we should know we should have a budget, a lot of times we don't do it. And so what's going to motivate us to action, to change? And I think that's making it easy on ourselves. And so if we don't do well at tracking our money because we we need to know where our money is going in order to win financially, then use mint.com, use an app. I mean, there's lots of different ways to track for us uh, where our expenses are going. Automatic savings accounts, there's different apps. Um, well, what are some of those that, uh, that, that allow us to just app? Acorns.com is one, or, or Acorns is an app, but there's multiple ones that you don't really have to do much and it does it for you. And so find ways that kind of automatically do things for you, uh, help you accomplish your goals. It's easy for you uh, to create a budget. You don't have to have a big Excel sheet, but just something that works for you, that moves you in the right direction, take some action, actually change your behavior in some way. So uh, that's what I would recommend. Do, do something that's easy, manageable, and changes your behavior. Thanks, Bryce. And, and Laura, what uh, year-end financial planning tips do you want to leave folks with? I think I would, I would just like to um, kind of underscore that, that the reason we do the things we recommend in money management 
Because sometimes they're, you know, creating a budget, tracking a spending plan may not sound like the most fun uses of our time, but really the whole purpose is, of that is that we know that those things that we recommend are the ways that we build wealth and financial stability for ourselves and controls control spending and control debt and have less money management stress. So the tagline I would just like to leave with everyone is to remember more joy, less debt. Great. Thanks, Laura. And a wonderful uh, reminder that uh, the information that you get from uh, Cooperative Extension is research-based objective information and the E-Extension Personal Finance Community of Practice brings that to you uh, through events like this. We're going to get to you, Eric, because I want to hear what Twitter is saying about these uh, these final tips, but I want to give them a little bit more time to respond. So in the meantime, here on YouTube Live, I've got some housekeeping to get to, uh, including your chance to win a gift card add a little bit to your holiday spending budget and win a gift card by tweeting your evaluation of this YouTube live broadcast or the tweet chat or both for that matter. All you have to do is uh, to mention the hashtag EXChat, that's E-X-C-H-A-T, uh, or and or at Money Talk one that's Dr. Barb O'Neill's Twitter handle in your tweet. Uh, tweet your evaluation in 140 characters or less, or or maybe you can continue it on into several tweets, but as long as you use that hashtag uh, or at Money Talk one in your tweet, you'll be entered uh, to win one of those gift cards for those folks who share their feedback and evaluation of this event uh, with us. So we have a few minutes left. I don't know if Twitter's quite caught up with us, but but Eric, are there any of those uh, year-end financial planning tips uh, yet to share on Twitter? Sure, we have a couple um, from uh, our experts that are, are leading the, the Twitter conversation. Um, a suggestion from Dr. Barbara O'Neill is to, uh, in the coming year, to resolve to uh, take part in a savings challenge. And um, there are a number of those. Some have been mentioned, the America Saves, um, uh, earlier by our panel. And um, Lorna Wounded Head also offers some very good uh, tips. Uh, one, is, and this has been covered several times, review and revise your budget for the coming year. Um, and then also, and I think this was mentioned, to take a little time to celebrate your financial successes um, just to sort of give yourself a little personal relief, but um, but also to, to remember to take care of of your needs, um, the in reducing debt and the like. And America Saves uh, suggests that we always need to continue to focus on planning and preparing for life surprises that may happen in the coming year. And those are things like the emergency funds and and the like. And that's what I've seen so far. Thanks so much, Eric. Dr. Eric Anderson is from the University of Idaho, and he's been keeping us in touch with what's going on in the Twitter chat today. Uh, out on Twitter are experts, Dr. Barb O'Neill from Rutgers University, Dr. Elizabeth Kiss from Kansas State University, and Dr. Lorna Sabo, Wounded Head from South Dakota State University. Our distinguished panelists, they did a great job today, a wonderful conversation. Thanks so much to Dr. Bryce Jorgensen from New Mexico State University, Dr. Laura Hendricks from the University of Arkansas, and Dr. Laura and Jones from Ohio State University. And thanks so much to you for uh, joining us for this U2 Live uh, event, or if you're listening to the recording, thanks so much for joining us. If you are uh, watching us live, make sure that you uh, complete your Twitter evaluation. Just use hashtag EXChat or the uh, handle at MoneyTalk1 for Dr. Barbara O'Neill to tweet your evaluation and be entered to win uh, a gift card uh, for sharing your feedback about this Twitter chat and YouTube live event. I'm your moderator, Bob Birch from North Dakota State University. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a very happy holiday season and good luck with your year-end financial planning. Take care. <laughs>